Next week's podcast with Matthew B. Cox is now up on Patreon. All podcasts will now be posted there a week before YouTube, as well as bonus content and discounts on Concrete Merch. Go to patreon.com slash concrete videos to check it out. Hello, world. Welcome to podcast number 78. I think it's 78. Is it 78? What fucking podcast are we on? Uh, yeah. Today's guest is Paul Loyan. Paul has been teaching physics for over 25 years in the United States and in Australia. On this podcast, we talk about all kinds of mind bending stuff including how scientists are creating black holes at the European Organization for Nuclear Research. That place is also known as CERN, C-E-R-N. We talk about dark matter, dark energy, and also how CERN has developed new ways to treat cancer with particle therapy or hadron therapy. Anyways, I hope you all enjoy this podcast as much as I did. Please welcome Paul Loyan. Danny, how, it's Danny, isn't it? Yeah, it's Danny. Good day. Good day. How are you doing, sir? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing I like well. Uh, I like your uh, your NASA outfit in the background. Oh, very nice. My lab coat. Yeah. Oh, that's just your, that's, just your, that's just your lab coat. Is that what you wear to work? Uh, sometimes I've been feeling a little quirky. Um, basically, it's got a whole weird, you know, terrible physics puns. Uh, uh, name tags uh, and so forth including my CERN pass over here so um it's basically uh half the time it's just a prop but uh i do wear it sometimes it. particularly if i'm teaching uh junior kids so um our school is all encompassing so i teach high school but our school's also got a, a junior or elementary school uh aspect to it so sometimes when i teach to the younger kids uh, you know, I, I ham it up with my lab coat. So yeah, yeah, I really like what you do, man. I like what you do with your with uh, your YouTube channel and the, the the educational stuff that you're posting on there. It's it's very Thank unique you. and it's very. I think it's really cool to see stuff like that garner so much attention from people because I feel like the way c culture, at least in the United States, is going, people aren't interested in this kind of stuff. They're more interested in mind numbing shit you see on television. And yep. anyways, I really like what you're doing. So how how did Thank you? you why did you start or how did you start doing this? Um, okay, so, um, well, I mean, it used to be called, my channel, of course, is Physics High. Um, and um, it used to be called High School Physics Explained. And it started off way back in 2015 when I um, wanted to produce some videos so that um, my students could access some of the content I teach in class if they were away. So it basically was setting up a camera in the classroom, me recording what I'm doing in front of the classroom and then uploading it. And I found that actually quite amateurish. Um, and so um, although some of my students benefited from it, I thought, you know, I would rather spend a little bit more time putting a bit more production value in it and then mm -hmm. actually teach it that's appropriate for the media, uh, for the medium, I should say. And so, yeah, that's sort of how it started. And I, then I discovered I started getting you know, being just because I'm posting on YouTube, I'm starting getting a little a bit of uh, more viewers beyond my classroom. Um, and so I thought I'd continue the process. So uh, initially, the idea was to support the education curriculum here in Australia. Mm -hmm. But physics is, you know, physics is physics. So whether you're in the States, or India, or Australia, or wherever. And so I, I sort of tailored it to be yeah, meet my school kids curriculum but at the same time not make it really nut down so for example um you know you'll find lots of youtubers producing uh, videos for ap physics for example uh and then they really go nutted down particularly you know this is what's the outcome for ap physics or whatever or let's say for the ib with the international baccalaureate and i thought no, no i want to broaden that so i just made it more general and um yeah, it grew from there, basically. And then I um, discovered that some of my videos started getting tractions outside of the high school. So, you know, first year university students said, oh, I, you know, I wish I, I, I had learned it this way. Or um, I did some videos on medical physics, which was an optional course here in Australia. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I had all these radiology students from India saying, oh, I really like your video. This has been really helpful for my course. So, yeah, it grew from there. And then... Um, yeah, starting to, and you know, late earlier this year, I changed my name to Physics High, 
um, because I wanted to not capture just the high school students. I wanted mm. to capture anyone interested in science, in physics. Um, and, you know, I've been dabbling and wanting to expand my channel now to beyond the curriculum. So, you know, dealing with general science with, um, you, know, you know, I've talked about CERN, of course, I've talked about climate change, and uh, I'm hoping to do other stuff that, you know, uh, astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology stuff, um, that is really attracts uh, watchers who look, you know, they say, look, I did physics years ago, but, or I want to do it. This has been in the news. I want to know a bit more about it. Um, you know, but from a more, you know, scientific perspective rather than, a, you know, a, an ignorant perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, what did you notice that, I mean, obviously, since you spend a lot of time in a classroom teaching students, right? Yeah. What, what do you think it is that makes people so attracted to the type of, the type of stuff you're talking about? Like that kind of, the, the way you portray it and the way you make it so entertaining, th oh, there's, wow. some, there's something to it where people want to watch it. Um, that's so much different from school, at least here in the United States. You know, most of kids in, in classrooms – they don't want to be there. They're not interested in it. They, they don't, the teachers don't, don't give it to them in a way that makes them want more. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm a teacher, so um, uh, I, I empathize with how teachers struggle in the class. I mean, I used to teach in the States. I taught, I taught physics for three years in the States um, uh, 20 years ago. And um, I think there's, look, if, if you say why students like science or why people like science, it's because they're actually drawing out um, really something from the early childhood. So one of the classic, I'll give you a sort of perspective. One of the classic questions you might hear a little kid ask is why? Why does this work, mommy? Why does this work, daddy? There's this natural inquisitiveness that they have about their world, whether, you know, whether it is like, why does a light bulb work? Why does the bug, dog make the sound the way he does? Um, whatever. And often the parents are scratching their heads, don't know how to answer to that. And, um, and I see that still in sciences in the junior classes, because I teach at a school that's, as I said, all encompassing. I see that still wanting to ask questions why. Um, but then what happens particularly around the um, ages of 12, 13, 14, so you read your classic uh, middle school range, you see that drop off a bit. And I think that question is a tough one to answer, uh, partly because um, it's, it's a real question that uh, teachers often ask, what is it that causes that drop off? I still ask it. I see students in my classroom who struggle at getting science and so forth. And I think it's a multifaceted concern. I don't, I certainly don't want to blame it on the teachers because as a teacher, I know the struggles that it is. And I think um, one, if I just address a couple of thoughts and there's lots of research in this, like there's no quick, easy answer. Number one, we live in an age where information is bombarded at us. So in other words, we just get fed information. You know, you can go click from one place to click one to the other. And there's no stopping of questions of why and looking into, in other words, which requires a little bit of a thought. We're easily distracted. And I think the social media issues and the, our instant fix things, instant gratification things does not help science at all in that regard. Mm. Secondly, I think um, in a lot of educational systems, um, content is king. That is, let's get all this information out that science is all about knowing all these facts, which it isn't. Science is about asking the questions why, and it's about exploring the questions why. Why does this happen? Well, let's explore it and so forth. And teachers are caught in the middle. They have to keep, teach this content that often bureaucrats write and say, we've got a need to know this information. And yet what they want to do is expose the questions to kids to why and inquiry learning, and, and they're caught in the middle. So we find that as a real struggle in, in trying to teach a way a science how science works but then at the same time the pressures of the curriculum the pressures of exams you know um you know i know that for in the states you know the, the issues of you know oh we've got to meet this content because they're sitting the sats or whatever other exams that they have at the end of the year 
Um, and it, it's got it all, 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 all topsy-turvy, um, you know. Um, and, yeah, I think, and, you know, the, um, I think um, science at the moment has a little bit of a, um, uh, an image problem. And I think um, that is, um, you still have this media image of the mad scientist or the nerd who doesn't have it, you know, the media and, and Hollywood portray science in a way that does not reflect real science, you know? Um, and um, I, think, I think Hollywood is trying to try, slowly coming around. And in the last few years, there've been a really number of good films that portray science in a far more realistic way. I think of Interstellar, I think of Martian as two good examples in terms of physics. Um, but yeah, um, when you have that portrayal, it's not that it's cool. Um, well, then you're going to ask teenagers to sort of go into that. You know, that's all a real struggle. So there are a few things there, but I'm sure your, your listeners might know a few other reasons why there might be reasons, but they're the ones that I come to mind. Yeah, there's just so many things. The age group you're speaking of specifically, I think there's so many other things like social media, like you mentioned, and video games are, are a huge yeah. thing where, you know, you can't, there's only so much you can take away from a video game without, you know, learning something new. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on, t on top of that, like the type of programming that you see on TV with the way that television networks buy certain types of TV shows, or they want certain types of shows that are just going to fit their ad dollars that are going to get, what's the next big thing? Like what's the next big show we're going to get instead of trying to integrate actual you know, valuable information like this onto the networks or, you know, the mainstream media. It's not about that. It's all about clicks and eyeballs. And I think that that's a fundamental mm. problem with, uh, with the way our culture works, especially when it comes to the media. Um, cool. So what you, you've been to CERN in Switzerland I have. I have. Mm -hmm. for people listening. Can you explain what CERN is? <laughs> so CERN, uh, which basically for, stands for Conscial uh, European uh, Pour la Recherche Nucléaire, uh, basically means the Commission, uh, European Commission for Nuclear Research. So in essence, um, I can make it a really short answer and say it's one big place where they do uh, nuclear research or uh, physics research. Um, and give you a slightly longer answer is that really it's a, a bunch of scientists who set up this uh, multinational uh, institution to explore better, a better understanding of what matter is and what, what we're made up of. Mm. So, um, you know, if uh, we're driven, I think, as, as humans to learn more about our world. And whether it is, okay, you know, 500 years ago, um, we have, you know, the sailors, I wanted to explore the other side of the ocean. What's on the other side of the ocean? You know, people were going into Africa. We, you know, we did, you know, the old uh, cliche dark Africa, you know, I want to explore what fun that is. And then we've got, you know, aspects of nature and how, how you know, what is um, the fundamental reason why we have living things the way we do. We have Charles Darwin and of course the discovery of, you know, DNA and so forth. And in, in terms of physics, we're dealing with, or oh, what is the matter that we're made up of? And, you know, if you boil it down, what does it made up? And so CERN is just one progression step of that in terms of a better understanding of how it works. So in a simplistic term, the way that we often understand what matter is made up of is to smash it. So hit it with particles and smash it up and see what those particles look like when they come off. Um, and uh, the discovery of the electron was basically that, um, you know, basically firing a beam and, what, and, and watching it, what happens to it. Um, and um, CERN is just magnifying that. So in essence, CERN is not just the Large Hadron Collider. A lot of people think that CERN is just that large ring. CERN actually existed since 1954 um, with different particle accelerators or particle colliders. And the idea again is fire particles at matter and see what sprays off. And if you look and measure what sprays off, you can understand what the structure is that you were smashing it into. So, yeah. So what is the Large Hydron Collider? <laughs> the Large Hadron Collider. Yep. How do you say the it? 
Hadron. Hadron. Yeah. But large, I'll explain that. I'll, yeah. I'll explain that. What does that mean? So, okay. So Large Hadron Collider really is a part of the institution of CERN, which is the basically in French, the version of the European Commission for Nuclear Research. Okay. And in essence, CERN is a physics institute that was set up in the early 50s um, and supported by a number of member countries, basically based in Europe. And the idea with CERN is to understand what matter is. So really what drives CERN and drives any scientific endeavor is discovering more about our world and how it works. So, you know, you've got, of course, in the 1500s, you've got the sailors moving across the oceans. What's on the other side? You've got the astronomers looking up to the sky. What is making up the stars and how does it move and so forth? And, you know, we've got Newton, for example, and understanding, uh, you know, their understanding of gravitation and so forth. You know, you've got scientists like Darwin with uh, how life evolves and you've got scientists like Watson Crick and and others who looked at well what's the fundamental nature of you know life the DNA aspect and so with physicists their understanding is well what particularly with particle physicists is what's the fundamental nature of matter you know we brought it down to atoms but then we say well hold on we discover that atoms are made up of other particles and we call them protons and neutrons and electrons well that was discovered in the early part of the 20th century through experiments that are often referred to as scattering experiments or collision experiments. Mm. Um, and, um, and how that all works is, you know, obviously the drives what scientists to know, know more, but then what happened is that they discovered that when they were looking at particles and, 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 you know, it's basically um, seeing their behavior in certain experiments, they discovered there are a whole bunch of particles that could not be explained by using that idea of, you know, an atom is made up of a proton, a neutron, an electron. Um, and so the quest was driven to say, well, can we learn more about what the proton and the neutron is, for example? Are they what we refer to as fundamental particles? Are they truly indivisible, right? Or, uh, or is, are they themselves made up of smaller particles still? And so, CERN developed a whole series of what we call particle accelerators or scattering experiments, which basically is really simple. You know, if you smash things together and were able to um, watch the, the particles that come off, then you have a better understanding of the conditions of what you were smashing. You know, it's sort of like, it's a poor analogy in one sense, but it's basically a uh, let's say a, a um, an investigator for in a car crash, you right. know they don't see the car crash. All they see is the particles strewn everywhere. But if you analyze the particles, then you can work out how fast was that car going, what was the other car doing at the time in the collision. All right. So by looking at the remnants of the collision, you can have a better understanding of what occurred at the collision and what was involved in the collision. And that's really what particle accelerators do. But in this said, we're not smashing cars together. We're smashing particles together, such as electrons, such as protons, um, and, um, and then seeing what comes off. And then as a result, you can get an understanding of what makes up those particles. So the more energy you put into the system, the more energy you can smash those particles, the more understanding you can have about what you're investigating. So in the case of the Large Hadron Collider, which is basically the largest particle accelerator in the world, um, it's basically smashing protons together and, um, and then seeing what comes off that. And that when you measure what comes off that, you have an understanding of what, well, first of all, what the protons are, but also what is the fundamental nature of those protons. Now, this is where the term comes in. A proton is simply what we refer to as a generic term of a hadron. So a hadron is basically uh, a type of particle we now know that is made up of uh, what we refer to as quarks. We may have heard the term before, quark or quark, mm. but in essence, we know that a proton and a neutron are made up of quarks and both of them are made up of three quarks. And so anything that is made up of quarks is called a hadron. 
And so that's why we call it the Large Hadron Collider. We could call it the Large Proton Collider, but it doesn't have to be a proton. It could be something else. Um, but um, it's using a proton because protons are easily produced. Basically, hydrogen is our main source of protons. So just a, a, a gas of hydrogen um, gas is, you know, basically all that is injected into the Large Hadron Collider because basically that's what the hydrogen is, a bunch of protons. Um, and how, what's the scale of this thing? Okay. Yep. So um, again, CERN is a very large place, but the Large Hadron Collider itself is a ring um, that is buried 100 meters under, under the ground. The ring is 27 kilometers in circumference. And in that, you have these two beams of protons spinning around at close to the speed of light. And there, um, the, at four points on that ring are what we call particle detectors. So the two beams are in two separate tubes going in opposite directions around this 27 kilometers track. And there are basically bunches of protons spinning around. Now, the numbers are mind-boggling. So each bunch that spins around contains about a hundred billion protons, right? And you've got another hundred billion protons going in the opposite direction like this. Now it's not just one bunch, but there's actually a whole series of bunches um, about separated about seven and a half meters around the tube. Um, and then um, they spin so fast that they go around that ring 11,245 times per second. So, oh my God. yeah, it's pretty fast, right? So the number I always like to quote is, okay, they travel at the speed, just shy of the speed of light, 99.9999991% of the speed of light. Now, to give you a perspective of how fast that is, um, if you were to run around the world at that speed, you could go around the world seven and a half times in one second. So, um, you know, it's incredibly fast. So you, what happens is, is that those particles are now traveling so fast when you smash them, and this is, happens at what we call detectors, and there are four of them on the ring. They basically make these two paths in crossover so that these two bunches now meet at the detector. And then hopefully these bunches will have some collisions of these protons. And of the 100 billion coming one way and about 100 billion going the other way, you may get only a billion collisions in that around or even less, right? You, know, you don't get many collisions going on. Um, but when they do happen, um, like the car crash, you can measure what comes off it. And those detectors are basically glorified machines that measure how fast they're going and what direction that they're going of the particles. And if you can measure that, then you can well work out what's going on here in terms of what those, what the collision entails. And so um, in essence, you know, it's a better understanding of what, how matter works, what's the nature of matter. Um, I could spend ages talking about this. So what, uh, in the process. what are they taking away from these experiments? Like what, what is there to gain from smashing all these particles together and breaking them apart and, and dissecting okay. them and looking them? What, how do you advance from that? Okay. Now <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, the, what drives, first of all, and I think that's important, what drives scientists is a better understanding of how the world works. So, I get that question asked a few times. What's the value, particularly on my YouTube videos where people go, oh, what a waste of money, right? Mm. Uh, let, me, let me draw out a few examples in history that ask, ask the same question, but it'll drive the point I'm trying to make home. Michael Faraday, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the scientist of the 19th century, right? Um, was working with electricity. He discovered that electricity and magnetism have, have an intricate connection. And, um, and, you know, electricity was very new at that time. Um, now, this quote that I'm about to use is apocryphal. They're not sure whether he actually he said it. But someone basically said, look, uh, you know, what use is this electricity? And his comment is, well, well, I don't know, but I'm sure the government will one day will find a way to tax it. And, you know, 
the inside is, is that, oh, this electricity, is there any use for it? But, you know, 50 years, 100 years down the track, we know how useful it is. Um, in the 1880s, Heinrich Hertz was examining the concept of these waves that uh, a guy by the name of James McClurk Maxwell discovered. I did a video on this. And he discovered these waves, these electromagnetic waves, and the name that was given to them was radio waves. And it was a very important experiment because it supported and validated what Maxwell's research had done. He himself, Hertz, had said, I don't think there's any practical use for these waves, but they're interesting. You know, and again, 10 years later, we had Marconi sending the first uh, signal from New York to Paris via radio waves, you know, um, uh, and of course, radio waves drives Bluetooth, so it drives Wi-Fi, it drives TV, it drives our te telecommunications. You know, again, had someone said, Hertz, stop researching, it's not worthwhile doing that because there's no use for society. Well, you know, what would we be missing at now? Right. right. Um, and then in the 20s and 30s, scientists were interested in particular types of materials that behave strangely in that normally when you heat a substance, its resistance, the ability to carry a current actually drops. But he just, the Michael Faraday had discovered this material called silicon, or he determined that silicon actually increases its uh, conductivity when it raises its temperature a little bit. Um, but understanding of why that led to what we refer to as often what we call semiconductor research. Um, again, purely it was driven by the fact of, I want to know more. I want to know what's going on here in order to what drives this. But from that came the concept of the transistor, the integrated circuit, all our computer technology is based on that, including solar cells as well, which is which also uses semiconductors. So I guess the question I then I want to th basically answer your question. There are aspects of CERN and particle accelerators at this stage. You could say, look, it's not about what we get out of it. It's not a basically a, a thing about simply about you know uh, what we gain out of it as a society in terms of a practical use, right? It's about understanding nature. But I will add, um, there have been many uh, benefits already that we've benefited from institutions such as CERN. Um, in 1989, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Tim Berners-Lee developed a way of communicating information across a computer network uh, in order to com in order to support you know a cu a communication between scientists at CERN, he created the World Wide Web. So you know that came out of them. The idea of um, uh, you know um, using our phone and this what we refer to as capacitive touch, the fact that as a touch, well that came out of basically CERN. They had this panel to this to basically control this. Uh, particle accelerator, they had way too many buttons. How can we do it in such a way that we can make one button do multiple things depending on what you touch? So capacitive touch came out of that. Um, we have um, technologies such as uh, PET scans. I'm not too sure if you're familiar with PET scans, uh, but PET scans is basically uh, using the concept of particles to diagnose and in some cases treat cancers. So using, um, again, uh, uh, the technology, we now have machines that are able to diagnose and treat cancers uh, or PET technology. And current research is using what we refer to as hadron therapy. There's that word hadron again. Yeah. If we fire a beam of protons or we can even use a beam of electrons. I just read a recent article about uh, uh, and um, on CERN's website actually of using a beam of electrons we can actually treat cancers with far less side effects. So in essence, to give you a short story, assuming you know my coffee mug is my human body here and I fire a beam of gamma radiation to treat a cancer, well, I'm gonna damage all the cells along as well as my tumor. And so what they do is to say, oh, okay, I fire a beam if I'm a beam this way and I fire a beam this way and I fire a beam this way and all the different places and they all intersect where the tumor is. Well, I'm going to kill the tumor. 
but I still will damage all those cells around it to a certain degree. Right. They discovered that if you fire a beam of hadrons, a beam of electrons, they actually behave differently. They actually drop most of their energy where you want them to. So in other words, you can actually cause, cause little, very little damage, but then do all the damage where the um, tumor is. Now that technology comes out of the technology that CERN's produced in order to understand nature. So, you know, no, we won't find necessarily a direct use to the fact that our protons and our neutrons are made up of quarks, but the technology that has been developed to work that out um, has had many, and I'm just using a medical example, there have been industrial uh, material um, based technologies, robotics and so forth, that have come out of places such as CERN because, you know, those technologies, someone said, hold on, that's really good to understand that. But you know what, let's apply that to this situation. And all of a sudden we have now, you know, utility out of a, a, a discovery of our, of our universe, if that makes sense. So is that treatment, that cancer treatment where they shoot the, the hydrogen atoms? Or what, the, oh, yeah, the, the protons, yep, yeah, hydrogen the, therapy. Yeah. yeah, when they shoot the protons, have they actually tested that on humans? Yeah, uh, yeah, there's actually, uh, yeah, it is actually a uh, feasible technology as we speak. However, the problem is the cost. So um, it's not something that you can say, you know, every, every corner um, um, uh, hospital can have it. So there are a number of places in, I think that are, I can't quite, don't quote me on this, but I think there are two or three centers in Europe that currently offer hadron therapy. Um, wow. There may be a few more, it, but it's, it's an emerging technology, but yes, it has been used to successfully treat cancers. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, 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 the issue that's, that stops it growing is the, um, is simply the cost factor in, in order to produce that. So, um, but that's, that's been true for a lot of machines. So, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever had an MRI, um, magnetic resonance imaging, um, in, any, in many respects, our understanding of matter through the work from CERN and Fermilab and all others are really is, as a, um, is basically uh, the reason why we have machines such as MRI machines, for example. Um, you know, if you, want to, if you were in the 70s and wanted to get MRI, the doctor would laugh at you. Like, it was like, you know, it's too expensive. You know, there's only a few places now. Now, of course, MRI machines are basically found in any, any small town um, because the, the technology has improved and the cost of running has improved and so forth. Um, same with, you know, uh, CT scans, same, same thing. You know, CT scans were developed in the 80s, 40s and 50s, but didn't really come into their own until much in the 70s and 80s because of costs being reduced and so forth. So I recently read an article talking about how CERN was experimenting with their collider, trying to make their own encapsulated black holes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is yeah. this true? Uh, look, yes. In one sense, yes, theoretically. So they would love to be able to make these, what we refer to as uh, quantum black holes or primordial black holes. Quantum black um, holes or primordial yeah, black holes? Yeah, the, the reason... Okay, so they're called quantum because they're incredibly small, okay? Okay. Um, we're not talking about the black holes that we have. It's interesting we talk about this. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the Nobel Prize for Physics was only announced uh, 12 hours ago. Was it really? Ro yeah, yeah. Oh. And Roger Penrose um, uh, got half of that prize for his work on the black hole. So the black hole understanding prior to the work of Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking was just a theoretical model based on Einstein's uh, work on relativity. But it was Penrose and Hawking who really established the fact, yes, they can exist. It's not a hypothetical. And uh, the other two recipients, uh, their name escapes me right now. Basically, uh, their work was on discovering a black hole in the center of our galaxy. But let me, let me give you an idea here of what the black hole is. I think that's important because a lot of people think black hole is massive gobbly, big giant thing that's swapping up all matter around it. And, you know, movies like Interstellar show you that, but there've been lots of other movies that have used that as a, almost a horror effect. Yeah, Interstellar was a, was a great one. 
Oh, that's it's one of my favourites. Uh, and it actually is uh, one of the few movies that got the physics right. And it helped. Really? It helped. Yeah. And the reason why is that the book is, it's based on a book by Kip Thorne. Mm -hmm. And Kip Thorne is a cosmologist, astrophysicist. And he was very clear with Chris Nolan. He said, look, I, I get this is a creative license required in the movie, right? But you can't break the laws of physics. You must, you must stick to the laws of physics that you can't break that. And so Chris Nolan yeah, followed that. And so as a result, a lot of the physics in the movie is very true, very accurate in terms of time dilation and all that sort of stuff. It is so, so it is so my, I had to watch it like three times just to understand and grasp what was happening and how yep. the dad didn't age a day, but his daughter aged a hundred years and he was changing history. That's almost impossible yep. to explain to somebody if you're having a regular conversation. It is. It is. It, well, it is. And, uh, and yet we know that we, you know, we digress away from this black hole stuff for a second, but um, the fact is, is that we know that to be true. So you know how uh, the dad age, doesn't age, right? The time passes differently than for the daughter on earth, right? Right. The fact, the fact is that your GPS machine on your phone works at all is because of that principle. Let me explain. GPS is basically resultant of a set of satellites in orbit around the earth in low earth orbit. But at any point, there are four satellites that have direct line of sight to your phone. And so they send signals back and forth to your receiver and to the phone and use a process of what we call trilateration. It's basically triangulation. If right. you can know the right. distance from those satellites, then the satellites and your phone can work out its position. Right. Okay. And so okay. it's basically trying, you know, if you draw three circles, right? There's only one or two points where those circles all intersect, right? And so if you know the distance of those circles, you can work out where you are in terms of that position. Mm -hmm. But that requires exceptionally good timekeeping. The satellites must be completely in sync of time because otherwise they can't work out your distance. So the problem is, is that the satellites are moving, but you're not relative at least to, to the earth. And so the satellite, because it's in orbit, right, it actually ages slower than you or I. Now, it's not like interstellar where there's major differences here. The Earth's gravitational pull isn't like a black hole. So as a result, the satellite maybe ages in literally nanoseconds difference compared to you and I. Now, you may say, well, that means nothing. Yeah, but for exact accurate timekeeping, that's absolutely essential. And so they designed the GPS satellites clocks to actually run a little faster so that when they're moving and their clock slows down by the fact that they are moving, just like interstellar, they are now in sync with your clock, which means they're going to accurately measure that. If scientists were not being, if they didn't account for this, time delay this or this time what we call dilation your your mobile phone gps could be out as much as five ten kilometers and you think about it five ten kilometers if you're lost in a bush or lost somewhere that's a significant difference that you don't want right. so um so although interstellar is a bit mind-boggling we know it to be true we have the experiments that verify this and you know our technology relies on it so, so is it the farther you get away from Earth, the slower you age? It's actually about your speed. It's about your speed and how and there's two things that affects this time change. One is your speed. So if I were to travel really fast compared to you, if you were to measure my time, it would be slower. Uh, the story I give to my students is this is let's say I, there's a nearby star. Our closest star, apart from our sun, by the way, is what we refer to as Proxima Centauri. Now, Proxima Centauri is about 4.3 light years away. Now, that means light travels 4.3 years just to get from there, right? So, you know, if that star were to go dead right now, we wouldn't find out about it for another 4.3 years because it takes 4.3 years for the light to get to us right? So that's how far our nearest star is. 
Now, let's say you decide to, well, how about I decide, because I think I'm a few years older than you. How about I decide to travel to Alpha Centauri, but I can't travel on a spaceship, let's say that's at that speed, but I can at least travel at a fraction of the speed of light. And let's say it takes me five years to get there, not 4.3. And I go there and I come back and I've been gone, according to my clock, 10 years, five years to five years back. Right. right? But because I've been moving relative to you, my time ticks a little slower which means when I return, I would look at my watch and say, hey, Danny, I've been gone for 10 years. And you'll say, no, Paul, you've been gone for 14 years. And you would have aged 14 years and I would have aged 10 years and our age gap's gone a bit closer. All right? So that's what we call time dilation. So that time is shift, right, is because there's movement between you and I. Again, that sounds weird. It mm. absolutely sounds weird but the experiment evidence is there to support it. It's, you know, science is weird sometimes. We just don't know, but it happens that way. Um, and so that's the motion that we have. The other aspect that affects time is your closeness to a gravitational field. So the fact that our satellites in orbit, our GPS satellites are moving is one factor that changes the time, but it's also the fact that gravity is different where they are than where we are. And so that also affects it. And that's why, for example, in the case of, um, you know, uh, Matthew McConaughey in Interstellar, he was moving, right, close to this black hole. And if you remember in the movie, they talked about going to one of these planets, which were closer into Gargantuan, which was the name they gave to that black hole. And they reckoned, hold on, if we stay out here, we're going to lose so many years. But if we move closer to Gargantuan and come back again, we're going to lose decades difference, you know, and therefore they had to make it really short time to get to that planet there and back. Right. And, um, and so again, that because the gravitational strength is stronger, closer to the planet and that affects how time works as well. Wow. So, you know, yeah, that's how it works. It's so, super fascinating. To the question you asked me initially, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Back to what we were talking about: black holes, Which creating, creating black holes at CERN. Black hole. So let's talk about what a black hole is. So a black hole is basically it's an object whose gravitational strength is so strong that light doesn't escape it. But what matters is two things: a) how big it is, in other words, how what's its mass, but secondly where that actually occurs, where it, the strength is so strong that light doesn't escape it, is dependent on how far away you're from it. So in the terms of gargantuan, right, it was a super, we're talking about a star in that case, was probably, I, I don't know in terms of what Kip Thorne was thinking, but I imagine that it was roughly the size of, let's say, uh, half of the solar system. It was a huge thing, right? We're talking about if you place Gargantuan where the sun is, it would stretch right past where Earth is. So we're talking about a really, really, really big object, right? If I flipped that around and said, let's, let's make the sun the black hole, shrink it down, right? We're now dealing with an object that is smaller than the city of New York, right? We're not dealing with a really big object. But the mass of it is still the same, which means that if I did that, the Earth wouldn't get sucked in, Mercury wouldn't get sucked in, they'd all stay in their orbit, exactly the same thing, because they're still that distance away from the center. You have to be really close, and I'm talking about, in this case, you have to be really meters from it, right? Or the, uh, the mathematics, basically, it says maybe only a couple of kilometers from it, um, for it to actually really start being so strong that light can't escape it. So if you get that concept, the fact that if, a black, if we create a black hole, the only ability of it to suck matter in means it has to have a very strong gravitational field, very, very close to it, right? So let's now go to our primordial black holes, which soon hypothetically could make. Um, they don't make it, by the way. 
they at the moment that they don't have the energy requirements to do that okay um okay. we're dealing here with objects that are to the order of the size i say 10 to the power of negative 35 meters now that number means nothing but if i were to take a primordial black hole so to speak and increase it to the size of a a let's say um and why is it called a primordial black hole okay because we believe and this is the reason why is because they believe that the early part of the big bang early part of the universe created these little primordial black holes okay the theory suggests the mathematical theory suggests they were part of the early stage of the universe and i'm talking about the early fractions of a second of the big bang right and this is what cern is trying to do so look it's not just about what matter is made up of but can we somehow create in a very 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 small space and i make that point particular clearly because a lot of conspiracy theorists get this wrong they want to create the early conditions of the of the big bang right and they go oh all that energy it's dangerous and so forth but hold on we're talking about energy in a really 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 tiny small space so we're not talking about a huge amount of energy overall we're talking about a really compact amount of energy in a really really small space you know um to give you an analogy right if i got if you've ever seen hopefully uh, terminator 2 where arnie sinks into the vo the vat of molten iron and i say how hot, hot is that and it's about a thousand degrees well that's a hot right or a well, thousand degrees celsius so about two thousand fahrenheit um and then i say to my students what about those sparklers that you have at New Year's Eve parties? How hot are they? And they go, oh, that's not hot. Well, that's actually, I say, it's about the same temperature. It's about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit or 1000 degrees Celsius. And they go, what, what's going on? It's because the energy is packed in a really, really, really small spot. It's not the total. No, no, it's packed in a really, really small spot. And that's what temperature is. Temperature is a measurement of how much energy is in a really, really, really small spot. And so when, you know it's not the total and so when we say we want to create the conditions of the early big bang we want to create the same temperatures in a really 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 small spot but it's not a total amount of energy in the sense of all-encompassing destroy the world type of energy in any expression does that make sense total totally makes yeah. sense good i guess the um, question is like can they can they can it slip out of their hands and can it just expand beyond their control without them under with i think a lot of people just don't understand what you just described Okay, of course it could slip on your hand. Have yeah. you ever had a sparkler get out of control and the sparks land in your hand? Does your hand suddenly explode? But it, could it, like, it, it could light. Fire? It could light light a forest. It could light your house on fire, right? Ah, uh, yes, that's true. But we're dealing here with okay. It's got to ignite something else that is itself got the stored energy. You know, if a sparkler hits a, a vat of of uh, of uh, gasoline. Uh, yeah, that's the danger, but it's not the sparks problem. It's the fact that you had gasoline beside you that could react with that little bit of energy. And in the end of, in the case of the big bang, uh, the, the CERN Hadron Collider, the amount of energy in those collisions, it did actually happen the, the, in terms of they had an, a, a, uh, an accident. Now people go, oh, accident. But again, put this into context the way that CERN's particle accelerators work is that they have to create these really, really powerful magnets to make that turn around that 27 kilometer loop. And the only way you can make those really powerful magnets is using what we refer to as electromagnets. So, you know, a, a electromagnet, most people know, basically it's a coil. If you run a current through it, it has acts as a magnet uh, and your doorbell <laughs> works on that principle. But the problem is, if you want a strong magnetic field, you need a very strong current. And if you want a strong current, you need a current that's so high, it doesn't melt the wire. So what they do is they cool these electromagnets down to under three Kelvin. Now, to give you perspective, that's minus 456 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're talking about really cold temperatures that they keep this in. And, um, only then can they have the magnetic field strong enough to turn my hadrons around. Now, in 2008, when they first ran the machine, the beam actually lost its direction and it hit the sides of the tube that was in. The problem there is 
it heated up the side of the tube, which caused the gas, the uh, helium in this case, helium was the liquid, it's liquid helium that's at temperature, caused it to raise in temperature. All of a sudden, the electromagnets weren't working properly because the temperature was higher. And as a result, this liquid helium went from a liquid state to instantly a gas state. Well, the gas expands. And as a result, uh, it blew a hole in the pipe. Now, that hole in the pipe damaged a number of electromagnets in there, but it wasn't a case of the total destruction. No, no, it was basically a gas release, an explosion, and caused instrument. But that was the end of the story, and it took a few months to fix it up. So you can't make this energy escape. You know, <laughs> another way of thinking about it is that the energy of these collisions that's occurring here between these two protons is equivalent to the energy of a beating mosquito. That amount of energy, right? Remember, the energy we're talking about is not is all encompassing energy. You know, it's the energy in a really, really, really tiny spot. But if you want to work out, well, how much energy is actually there? Well, it's equivalent to a mosquito, right? So um, we're not dealing with world destroying energies am amount here. We're dealing with temperatures in a really, really confined spot. And even if it does run out of control, yes, it might damage the equipment, but it's not going to be a case of, you know, it's not going to be an explosion or, you know, d you know, uh, you know, put it this way, the people in Geneva have got nothing to worry about and CERN's based in Geneva, right? Uh, if something happened in CERN, they would never know about it. In fact, if you were just across the border in France in the small town and I've crossed that border, literally it's 10 meters away from one of the, um, from one of the um, uh, detectors. Um, if something happened, you wouldn't know about it because the amount of energy released is extremely small in the total amount of, if it happened, that makes sense. Absolutely. We haven't answered the black hole question yet. <laughs> right, 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 right. So the black hole, these primordial black holes are incredibly small, right? We're not dealing with gargantuan sizes. And I said to you, how about we try to get a perspective of how small these black holes are? If I were to take these primordial black holes and magnify its size to about the size of about a millimeter across, a few millimeters across, then comparatively a grain of sand we get this, a grain of sand in that comparison will be more than 10 times the size of our known universe. Let, let, let me let's stick that with you. Let me put it another way. If I have a, if I have a, gray, a, a, a millimeter, a few millisided black hole, okay. and I say, well, what's the size of an atom right, in that comparison? Well, the atom would be the size of our solar, our Milky Way, our galaxy, our Milky Way. So can you see the perspective here I'm trying to say is, is that these black holes are not big. They right, are incredibly right. small, right? And the only way they can, we can register their existence is of their energy that they give off. And we're talking about an incredibly small amount of energy. Right. Okay. So these okay. black holes are really, really small. Now people say, well, so who cares if they're small, they can grow. And I want to give three reasons why you shouldn't be worried. The first thing is that we, the theory is now, you know, Stephen Hawking, everyone knows of Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Uh, developed the theory that basically black holes do evaporate. They do actually radiate some energy. So over time they actually shrink. Now, the rate at which they shrink is dependent on their size. So the black holes, such as in Gargantuan, well, they would take trillions, literally trillions of years to evaporate away. But our little tiny quantum black hole that CERN could create would practically evaporate within a microsecond, incredibly small time. They would not survive long at all. So that's the first reason. The second thing is, as I told you, they're so small that they would not actually be anywhere near any other matter to suck energy in. Remember my analogy of my grain of sand, right? And my atom is the size of the galaxy, right? Well, what's the likelihood of this grain of sand or this little tiny particle as it moves to actually hit anything when most of the atom is empty space, 
right? It, it, it's highly unlikely to ever, ever, ever strike anything. Now remember, it has to strike something within a given time and it only lasts a fraction of a fraction of a second. Again, it's not gonna suck anything in before it completely disintegrates. And the last thing is this. People say oh, CERN is doing these energy experiments and they've, it's never been done before. And I tell you, actually the energies that CERN does happens every day above our heads. So we have things called cosmic rays out in space and they strike the atmosphere and hit the particles, the gas particles, as you know, these cosmic rays come in. And those cosmic rays have energies far higher than anything that CERN has produced. So in other words, what CERN is doing is actually a miniature version of what's already happening at our atmosphere. And we know this, this was, we detected cosmic rays in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. We know that it exists. If they were to get energies to create black holes and the cosmic rays were already creating them in our atmosphere, remember these black holes would probably be created, but then pop out of existence. Mm -hmm. Well, we're still here. So the fact is, is that if CERN was able to make black holes, then our atmosphere would be creating them all the time. Other stars would be bombarded, other objects, other planets, other stars also bombarded by these cosmic rays. And um, we would be having black holes being created all the time. Now, again, we're still here. <laughs> the universe right, is right. still here. Right. So the fact is, is that the chances are is, is not. And I think part of the problem, I think what really is confusing and I, I'm, uh, is this. Physicists have a, t have a tendency to go, oh, I wonder what happens and like this. And, you know, just hypothetically in a very tone, low key. And so when they say, yeah, we might be able to create big holes and someone says, well, can we be dangerous? They'll be going, oh, yeah, well, whatever. And all of a sudden the media grabs on that and it's like, oh, that's dangerous and so forth. And in fact, John Ellis, uh, who's a theoretical physicist based at CERN, I, I, did, I didn't actually get the chance to talk to him, but I did see him walking around. He does look like a crazy, wild, hair, uh, hairy guy. He was asked, he was basically asked the same question, can it happen? And he simply said, nah, you know, it was blunt as is in the sense it's of no, 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 absolutely not. You know, and it's just, it doesn't help if some physicists just sort of, you know, you know, hypothetically talk about this while the media is going to go, oh. and in reality is the answer is no, it's just not going to happen. And as I said to you before, CERN hasn't done it yet. They haven't got the energies mm -hmm. in their collisions to create that as yet, as yet. Can you explain what dark matter is? Great question. So <laughs> I can answer that in by saying, yes, I'll answer that. And then I can say also, I have no idea. And scientists don't have any idea. So let me explain. So our universe is made up of matter and we know that already. And we understand how matter works because in essence, it, it, it has gravity. It, there is a gravitational field. So the fact that you and I are sitting on the earth is the fact that we have mass and we're, you know, we behave, you know, you jump off a two story building, you will experience gravity and it's not going to come out good. And so if we study how objects behave in our universe and we can see how they move, then we understand something about the mass of that particle, right? Or the mass of the object because of the way that gravity works. But in the late 1990s and, and subsequently, um, there are a series of experiments, a, a cosmological experiments, astronomical experiments for studying galaxies that discussed, that looked at how they actually rotated, how they moved in a circle. And they discovered that if they measured all the mass in that galaxy, um, it did not, and therefore work out how much matter there was from by measuring how fast it spun, remember based on gravity, they had a problem. Because if they measured the mass by counting the number of stars and all the gases in there that they can read off, and then measure the mass about how it behaves under gravity, the mass that it had was far, far higher than what they measured. In other words, the galaxy and other galaxies as well, not just one galaxy, but other galaxies and how they work, work had far more mass than what we measured. 
So in other words, there's some matter there, some stuff that has mass, but we can't measure it directly, but it is there. So we have no idea what it is, dark matter. So, so as a result, you know, we discover that there's a significant portion of our universe that has, gives it far more mass, but we can't measure it directly. Whenever we try to compare it to our direct measurements of matter by measuring the stars or measuring, you know, the, you know and, and it can be, can be done for quite, with quite great precision and how much, you know, but the gas that's there, uh, they always come up less. And then there's a second problem. The other aspect is, is that the universe we know is expanding, but because the universe has mass overall, the initial view is, is that, well, hopefully, what that does is that the gravity, because of the expansion is due to the Big Bang, and hopefully what will happen is that mass will cause gravity, cause it to come back in again. Mm. Right. And now, and so, you know, if, if you read the textbooks of the uh, 70s and 80s, they said, well, what's the universe going to be ending like? Well, maybe we'll have what we call the big, big crunch. The universe will expand and then collapse in of itself and then repeat the process. Or maybe it's going to be static. So it's going to be just to the point where it just grows and eventually the expansion is about equal to the gravity and it'll just sit there like that. What they discovered and uh, which uh, by the, uh, a scientist by the name of Brian Schmidt uh, got a Nobel Prize, he and his team for in 2011, is that the universe is not just moving out, it's speeding up. It's going faster and faster out. And so there came the idea is that, well, there's this other energy that is actually driving the universe outwards that goes against gravity or negative energy, if you want to say it that way. And that came the term dark energy. So whenever you talk to scientists, or astronomers about dark matter, inevitably they will also raise the idea of dark energy, that there is the universe but if we measure the universe that only 5% of our total universe is ordinary matter, everything else is dark matter and dark energy. And so, you know, uh, the question then is, well, what is that matter? Right. And this is the question you really ask. What is dark matter? It's the right, matter out right. there that we can't measure, but clearly it's having its influence on our universe, but we don't know what it is. So, um, there are all weird types of uh, names that scientists give to the possible uh, reasons for what this dark matter is. Uh, terms such as cue balls, which is a weird name, uh, wimps, which basically means for weak interacting uh, massive particles, but they don't know what it is, right? It's just a name. And one of CERN's desires in their experiments is that if they smash the particles, protons, hadrons, or whatever, and other, the other particle accelerators that occur there, is maybe they can find some evidence for particles that could explain that missing matter. But like I said, the big problem with dark matter is it's, it, it, we can't detect it. And the way that we detect it is either it has an electrical charge, so we can bend it in electric fields and magnetic fields, or it gives off radiation, um, and, uh, but it does none of that. And so, you know, you can fire stuff at it, you know, if you wanted to do it that way, but if it doesn't interact with it, then you'll never know. You'll never know that it exists there. You know, the fact that you are staring at my screen and seeing me is because light hitting me and bouncing off and hitting the camera and it's interacting with me, right? And you therefore know I'm sitting there and I know you're sitting there. But if the light passes straight through me, then you'd never know I was there, right? So the fact is that light or particles has to somehow interact with me and cause me to do something to that in order to measure it. And right. that's the problem with dark matter. We look for all the ways of trying to do something, hit it with something, or in the case of particle accelerators, try to discover particles that could have the properties that would explain why we don't see it in our galaxies. But it's there, it's there, but we just don't 
no, you know, we don't, we can't directly measure it. And then that's dark matter, right? It's dark because we don't know what it is. You know, it's out of our, out of our vision, so to speak, but it's definitely showing its influence. A super and, uh, intriguing name for it too. Dark matter or dark energy. It's super heavy metal sounding. Is <laughs> like a, like it's, a metal it's, band. It's, but you know scientists sometimes have the weirdest ways of naming things i mean really like like dark matter is literally like i have no idea it's really where the name came out of dark you know the old idea i mentioned quark right uh it was like what sort of name is that well it's actually a direct quote from a book by james joyce called finnegan's wake and the person who developed the theory by the name of murray gell man he just liked the phrase from, you know, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but the word quark appears there. And he's like, oh, I like that. So, mm. you know, just t tell that idea. So the, we have some weird names, but yeah, um, in essence, the dark simply means we don't know. We have no idea. So what does that mean for, for us if the universe is ever expanding versus going back in? <laughs> directly not much <laughs> so um uh, there is um in essence it's speeding up but what that means in the life of the universe let's talk about that that eventually all that energy is going to go it's going to dissipate so um in in the long scheme of things, the universe, if it continues the way it does, will eventually die out. All the stars will stop burning. They will run out of their fuels. You'll have stars going to black holes. There'll be anything left uh, in the end and other black bodies. And, and in essence, it's, it's just it's dark, dark matter is left over. Uh, dark matter and other matter as well, but it won't be. But okay, dark matter in the sense we just talked about, but also any real matter, the normal matter, will be dark in that sort of it won't release radiation it won't have light anymore so it will just go black now um, terrifying it's terrifying but we're talking about something that's going to occur in over the trillions of trillions of years here we're not talking about something anytime immediate i think in terms of humanity our more immediate pressing problem <laughs> in an astronomical sense is the death of our own sun so our death of our own sun is probably going to occur in about well you know give or take maybe three to four billion years time now people go oh my goodness that's a problem but you know uh, life has existed on the earth for only about you know two billion years and i'm talking about primordial life right the earth itself has only existed for four and a half billion years and humanity, as we know it, we're only dealing with a few, you know, uh, 100,000 years and so forth. You know, Australopithecus, which is one of the early humanid ancestors, so to speak, you know, 2 million years ago. And that is one, you know, one, one uh, you know, a, a fraction of the life of the earth. So you and I won't have any problems with our sun. And I think we have far more issues of uh, humanity destroying itself through other means so you know we say it's terrifying but for you and i right here it, it has really no real impact at all but i guess it's again about science saying look we'd like to know how this works we know what's what the process is behind it you know um it's not about as i said to you before about learning for the sake of what can we get out of it it's about understanding our place in the universe you know, um, how it works, you know, that's driven humanity from day one, that we want a better understanding of the world we live in and our place in it. And science is basically that it's about understanding who we are, and what's our place in our universe and how it all works and how it fits, and allowing our mind to go, wow, this is an amazing place, you know, and, and, and even more amazing when we work off some of the details of how it works, whether it's in the really small, which is, you know, the quantum world, which is what CERN discovers, or the really big, where we look at astronomers and cosmologists and say how the universe works. And then, interestingly, CERN is dealing with both because they're wanting to understand the nature of matter at the quantum level, but also understanding dark matter to say, look, that gives us understanding of our cosmos as well. You know, it's about the search for meaning and the search for understanding. And that's really what science is. Um, it's saying, why does it work this way? It's back to my very first thing I said, you know, 
scientists are basically people who haven't lost that sense of why is that daddy? Why isn't that mummy? No, they, they've stuck with that and they've, um, you know, taken that into their field um, and worked out why, you know, and if we ended up developing these technologies that benefit mankind, benefit humanity and so forth, fantastic. But that's not why they do it. They do it because I want to know why. I want to know, you know, and they're excited by the discoveries that they make in the process. That's amazing, man. Well, hey, I'm, I'm a little bit crunched for time today. We had to cut it to about an hour and 15 minutes, but um, yeah. I really appreciate you doing this. I want to do a follow-up down the road for sure where we can sit here for a couple hours and go through some stuff. Um, yeah. What was your so, last name? Your first name's Paul. Paul. My last name is Loyan, L-O-O-Y-E-N. Um, and so, yeah. Um, how can uh, people encourage... find you, people listening to this, how can they find you on YouTube and, and yeah, so websites easy. or whatever? Yeah. So my my tags at the big is physics high so uh in youtube you'll find me there uh facebook physics high twitter physics high um i i have instagram and physics high though i haven't used it as much but basically and then i have a website as well which is funnily enough www.physicshigh.com um so that's the way to find me and uh like i said if you go there uh you'll see a lot of sort of straight physics content but um, I hope that people can see to follow me because I'm hoping to, you know, do more general stuff in terms over time as well. Um, I'm a full-time teacher, so it's a real balancing act. I'd love to be able to get enough subscribers that I can, you know, maybe uh, go part-time teaching and so forth and put more time in my YouTube and communication of science because that's what I really am passionate about, communicating science and physics uh but um you know yeah it's, it's it's that's critical that's critical not just understanding it but, i mean anyone can not anyone but it's one thing to understand it and and have the knowledge it's another thing to be able to communicate that to the world and to everybody yeah. else that's that's just as important as having the information totally 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 i mean i think um one of the things I always uh, I, I strive towards, and I know I'm not so I get it, but what, I love it when I hear students say, I really love physics. And why do you love physics? Because I had a teacher who really was passionate and communicated that passion towards me. And, you know, and I, I'm always excited by the fact that people are switched on science because someone took the time to communicate it effectively to them. And as a result, you know, they um, were, um, drove home. Can I give you a little story that I picked up at CERN, something yeah. really um, that drives that particular point home. I um, met up with a guy named David Fish, and maybe he watches this as well. He's actually a teacher consultant for the Perimeter Institute, which is a, a physics institute based in Toronto, Canada. And uh, he gave some of the presentations that we had at CERN, and he shared about a student when he was in teaching about a student, he said, um, was a little bit lost, didn't know what to do. And he just encouraged her and said, you know what, I think you should look, do a bit of research and uh, look into what dark matter is. It's interesting that you said dark matter here. And she went, okay. And so she did that and it switched life on. And as a result, she did a physics degree. And as a result um, of the physics degree, she decided to go into particle physics. And as a result of particle physics, she got a, a position at CERN. And, um, and, and as a result, you know, basically was in the team for the particle detectors from that. Now, I'm a day after he presented that, I'm sitting at lunch in CERN with Dave next to me. And he was talking to this girl on the other side. And the girl said to me, she was talking to Dave, and she said, you know, I've really been passionate about this Atlas experiment involved in it, but I think I might go to this other project over here at CERN and so forth. And all of a sudden the penny dropped. The girl that I was talking to across me was the girl that I, he actually had just switched on with Dark Matter when she was in high school. You know, so here's this girl who has gone from this encouragement to do Dark Matter because one teacher took the time to just invest some time into her and now she was doing great things at CERN. She was just not doing a PhD student. She was now employed full time at CERN and looking for other ways to, in, in, you know, to explore science. And I, and I think that's the key, you know, you ignite a passion, you know, with knowledge and explore it. Yes, it takes determination. Yes, you need to work hard at it. It's no quick feeding like social media or whatever. You've got to take time but it's so rewarding when you 
invest that time in learning and I continue. You know, I tell your viewers, keep asking questions. Why, why, why? And take the time to look for the answers. And uh, that's the way science works. That's amazing, man. Such a cool story. Hmm. Yeah, it does. It takes a, it takes a lot. You got to you got to put the time in and there's no instant gratification with this kind of stuff. Nothing that nothing that's worth anything is is instant. That's right. That's exactly right. You said that exactly right. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Thanks. And uh, and then hopefully we can do this again in the future. I'd love to. Love to, Danny. Cool, man. Thanks again, Paul. Okay.